With support from NIHCM, the National Institute for Healthcare Management, we're spending the next three episodes talking about how drugs get approved in the United States. In this first episode, we discuss the drug approval process from the discovery phase all the way through to what happens after its approval. That's the topic of this week's healthcare triage. It can take up to 15 years on average for a drug to get from the lab to being approved for patient use, and it's not an easy journey. Five out of every 5,000 compounds make it from preclinical testing to human testing, and from there, only one in five garners FDA approval. Drug development begins at the discovery and preclinical testing phases. This means scientists at the lab bench work to identify potentially useful compounds. They study the chemistry of the compound and whether it showcases biological activity that may be useful in disease of interest. And then they begin to assess drug formulations and safety. This is also where they work to understand things like drug absorption, metabolism, and excretion. They use several tools in this phase, including things like cell culture and animal testing. On average, this lab phase takes around six and a half years. Depending on how these phases go, an investigational new drug application, or IND, can be submitted to the FDA. This requires documentation of all the information gathered in the discovery and preclinical phases, as well as detailed experimental protocols for potential human trials. Again, only five out of 5,000 compounds successfully make it to this point. For these, the IND is examined by the FDA and an institutional review board. If there's no objection, human trials can begin within 30 days, though the IND can be terminated at any time. The start of human trials kicks off the clinical phase. The clinical phase is separated into three parts. The first consists of a small group of human subjects, usually fewer than 100. Researchers investigate how things like absorption, metabolism, safety, and tolerability look in human beings. This can be stopped by the FDA at any time if safety concerns arise. This portion of the clinical phase lasts, on average, about one and a half years. If researchers are satisfied with these results, they move to the second part, which tests the drug in a larger group, usually between 100 and 500 people, so that they can assess things like optimal dosage, effectiveness, and gather further safety information. This portion of the clinical phase lasts, on average, about two years. If all goes well there, they move to the third part, in which the compound is tested in somewhere between 1 and 5,000 people. Researchers work to understand the benefits and risks of the drug at a large scale, looking for things like long-term side effects. These trials are very tightly controlled and can take a long time to complete, most often several years. If all goes well with the clinical phase, a new drug application can be submitted. Prior to 1962, this application required only proof of safety and would be automatically approved if the FDA didn't object within 60 days. Now, however, the application also requires proof of efficacy, and there's no time limit for approval. As we said in the beginning, only one of the five drugs that made it to the clinical phase will achieve FDA approval. Approval of a new drug application takes around one to two years. The FDA's Center for Drug Evaluation and Research reviews the submitted data, preferably from two clinical trials, to rule out chance results, though there are exceptions for this, like if a disease is very rare. They use these data to determine things like efficacy and safety, keeping an eye out for any issues that may affect the quality of the data. It's important to remember that while FDA approval means the drug has been thoroughly evaluated for safety, that doesn't mean there aren't side effects. During the approval process, the benefits and risks of the new drug are weighed against treatments already available, if there are any, for the condition in question. If there are already treatments on the market with fewer side effects, the benefits of the drug really need to be better to outweigh additional risks. But on the flip side, a new drug will be viewed more favorably if it provides similar treatment with fewer side effects than already approved drugs. Committees composed of relevant experts advise the FDA on things like safety, efficacy, and appropriate labeling that includes things like a description of the drug's risks. Once a drug is approved and is being marketed and prescribed to patients, a fourth phase begins where the FDA gathers more safety information, including reports of adverse events. Based on this information, the FDA may require changes to marketing or labeling, or if serious enough, they may require the product to be removed from the market. Following approval, a drug might be prescribed by a doctor for other conditions or given in a different form or dose, something we call off-label use. 
This may include things like chemotherapy approved for one type of cancer, but used to fight another type. A drug given as an oral solution when it was approved as a capsule, or two doses of a drug being prescribed when only one dose was approved. These off-label uses generally happen when a condition has no treatment or when all treatment options have been exhausted with no effect. This occurs at the discretion of a medical professional, but such uses have not been determined by the FDA to be safe or effective. So that, in a nutshell, is the complicated process of drug approval in the United States. However, sometimes the usual rules don't apply. This can happen when a drug has the potential to improve health outcomes in ways that aren't achievable by other available drugs, or when a patient with a terminal illness wants to try an investigational drug. In the second episode of this series, we'll discuss those cases and when and why they come into play. Hey, did you enjoy this episode? You might enjoy this previous episode we did for ketamine on depression that discusses on and off-label approaches and uses. We'd like it if you'd like the video down below, consider subscribing to the channel, and go on over to patreon.com slash healthcare triage where you can help make the show bigger and better. We'd especially like to thank our research associates, James Glasgow, Joe Sevitz, Edward Lillehome, and Brian Nam, and of course, our Surgeon Admiral, Sam.